picture this, 1920s, a village nestled in the equatorial rainforest. Orange, amber, and the moon are the only things that give you light. You're sitting on hand-woven mats made out of rattan or bamboo, laid out on the iron wood floor. This corridor is endless. The longhouse is home to 30 families or even more. A mother sings a lullaby to her baby. Look, look, on up at Don't a berry but mopey no do. Cicadas and frogs hum through the night air, and the low murmur of conversations can be heard bouncing off the wooden walls. A man stands up and says, She's here, the spirit is here. And off the wall, he takes a lute instrument, the sape, carved out of one piece of wood, strings made out of pineapple fiber, and he plays a song. Now picture this, the year is 2000, a village nestled in the equatorial rainforest. Your mobile phone is charging in the corner, and you're watching TV, the latest telenovela from a country far, far away. You open the freezer to defrost the chicken that came from the nearest town about eight hours away. You're thankful for electricity. A pickup truck arrives to bring the children to school. There's a road now, which also means that there's access to health care, which is fantastic. And on the way to school, the children drive past big trucks carrying fallen trees. The logs are being transported to a point downstream so that the river can bring them down to a collection point. In the 1980s and 1990s, Borneo's logging industry was one of the most intensive the world has ever seen. But I'm not here to talk to you about logging. That's a complex subject. I'm here to talk to you about something simple, which is the ability of music to translate memory into sound, so that across generations, listeners are invited to relive these experiences. I grew up in the small city of Kuching, in the Malaysian state of Sarawak, on the island of Borneo. My father is Kalabit, which is one of the smaller uh, my father is Kalabit, which is one of the smaller indigenous tribes of the island, and my mother is English-Italian, a teacher and an anthropologist. My Saturday afternoons were spent with my cousins, learning and receiving songs and stories from the Sape master, Matthew Ngao. We were his first students and some of the first females to ever play the Sape. After I left high school, I never lived in Kuching again. I always wanted to live in big cities. I was in Manchester in the UK. I lived in Kuala Lumpur. I lived in Singapore. And I always had the view and the aim of climbing that corporate ladder. 
But during that time, I was never completely happy and I was never really fulfilled. And one afternoon, as I sat in my living room in our condominium, listening to the sounds of traffic lights changing outside, the buses deflating their tires, the trains whirring on the train lines, that's when I saw her. Dusty, cracking, moldy, my old sape. I spent the next few days reviving her, carving frets out of bamboo to very, very specific heights, heating beeswax to stick the frets onto the sape, restringing her with steel fishing line, and oiling her down with coconut oil. And when I played again, I felt like light was entering my body. I felt peace, and I felt love.
that song, Bambong Jae, or Atak Lan, is sung in the endangered Kanya language. And it's a song about being together with my very, very true friends under the moonlight by the river, the river that gives us so much life. Earlier this year, a group of us got together to make a music video for this song. And what we wanted to do in this music video was to highlight the human attitudes towards our rivers right here in the heart of Kale City. A 2015 study from Stanford University shows that more than half of the world's population live in urban settings, and that number is set to increase to 70% across the next few decades. And with this increase, there is concern that humans are becoming more and more disconnected from nature, and that affects our well-being and our mental health. I was shocked to find out that in 2005, the term nature deficit disorder was coined. As part of my artistic process, I seek to embody the life of my ancestors, to live out the memories that they've passed to us through songs and through memories. And I do that by experiencing, by participating, in the rice harvest, under the hot sun with my family, as described in a very old Kalabit song. <laughs> Laying down overnight fishing nets with my cousins and planting seeds for fruit trees for our future grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And why I seek to live out these memories is because I want to understand how my ancestors wrote these songs, how they wrote this music that they used to use to heal each other. Sape music has an effect on people. Listeners tell me that when they hear Sape, they feel calm. They're transported to a place in their minds that they've never been to before. When they listen to the music, they get goosebumps. Some people cry. And when I ask them why, they can't explain. You see, our songs were written not by one person, but by the people, by our ancestors that lived in the headwaters of the Baram River, they did not know concrete, or high-rise buildings, or cars, or money, or brands. They knew the tall trees and the smallest shrubs of the oldest rainforest in the world, the clear rivers and the skies just as clear, the name of every insect and every bird in one of the most biologically diverse landscapes. As humans, we have an inherent need to be with nature because we are nature. We are part of nature. And that's what Sape music reminds us. It awakens a memory that there was a time, really not so long ago, that we lived in a balance with nature. This is a song that we wrote called Gituan, or Stars. And it's a song of memory, cosmic balance, and ancestors.